look forward to hearing this discourse from Brother Barr, who's of the Brooklyn Bethel family. And the title of the discourse is, Are You Content with Jehovah's Provisions? Let's give him our undivided attention. Just imagine, according to recent reports, there are some 800 million people that got up this morning and didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. The World Health Organization maintains that this malnutrition, so worldwide prevalent, is responsible for the deaths of some five million children every year. Ten minutes die because of this every minute. What a tragic story that is to have to tell in this enlightened 20th century. But you know how much this is in fulfillment of Jesus' prophetic words regarding the end of this system of things at Matthew 24 and verse 11 where he stated there will be food shortages at the conclusion of the system of things. Now that's a sad enough note that I've started on to give this talk this morning. But you know, listen to this sobering fact. Today approximately six billion people are dying of spiritual hunger. And among these are the two billion, seventy million persons who belong to what we call Christendom, those who profess to be followers of Christ today in the world. And this is, a, this is a far greater tragedy than the physical hunger. The amazing thing is that this spiritual hunger was foretold by one of God's prophets, the prophet Amos. I wonder if you would turn in your Bible with me, as I'm doing, to Amos Chapter 8. Now, as you're turning up your Bible, let me remind you that Amos lived about 800 years before Jesus lived, whom we commemorated his death last Thursday evening. He was a very humble shepherd. He shepherded his flocks in the solitude of those bleak, mountains about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. If any of you have been there, and I have, my, it's a bleak area. And that's where Amos grew up and did his job of shepherding. But suddenly, in the middle of his life, he was, Jehovah sent him to prophesy to the idolatrous ten-tribe kingdom of Israel with its capital in Samaria. And let's say this, God's word clearly shows without the shadow of a doubt that apostate Israel was an apt foregleam portrayal of Christendom today. Now with these words in mind, with that little background, let me read you Amos chapter 8 verse 11. Look, there are days coming as the utterance of the sovereign Lord Jehovah And I will send a famine into the land, a famine not for bread and a thirst not for water, but for hearing the words of Jehovah. Now, do we find such a spiritual famine in Christendom today? I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to let some of the leaders of Christendom answer that question for themselves. A recent European Protestant conference, a clergyman stated this, and I quote, The former Christian West can no longer call itself Christian. Europe has become a missionary field. What an admission. Or take this German, Roman Catholic theologian, Professor Metz, the University of Munster. He said this, Our Western religiousness is secularized down to the bone. It seems that Not even a trace of messianism has been left over. Rulership, my God, has vanished from it. 
He does not fulfill a role within the churches anymore. That's a Roman Catholic for you. And then just one more, a clergyman down there on the African continent by the name of James Giddy Adesso. He said, the clergy have failed and the laity have collapsed spiritually. Need I say more? I think those three quotes are sufficient. Wherever you might roam in the realm of Christendom, you'll find that situation, I meant to tell you to keep your Bible open, in Amos chapter 8 and verse 12. I'll give you a moment if you haven't got it. All right. Verse 12. And they will certainly stagger from sea all the way to sunrise. From no, no, all, from sea all the way to sea, and from north even to the sunrise. They'll keep roving about while searching for the word of Jehovah, but they will not find it. Now, I think a question that could be asked at this point is, why has such a condition arisen? You see, God's word, the Bible, is available in 2,200 languages today. And you know, it's a circulation of far greater than any publication. Four billion copies. So, God's thoughts and ways as expressed in the Bible are available to a tremendous number of earth's inhabitants. So what's gone wrong? God's prophet Jeremiah pinpoints the real root cause of this spiritual famine, just as it was in the days of Amos. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. There are are two bad things that my people have done. First, They've left even me, the source of living water. Second, in order to hew out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot contain water. That expression, they've left me the source of living water. The, uh, another translation, the today's English version translates this, the spring of fresh water. That's who they've left. And how true this is. Christian leaders have actually turned their backs on Jehovah. And they've done this in a very literal way by blotting out God's name from the translations of the Bible that they've been responsible for. I'm just going to take one one example the Revised Standard Version. Now, the Revised Version contained the name of God originally, but now it's been taken out. Why? Listen to what they say in the preface. The word Jehovah does not accurately represent any form of the name ever used in Hebrew. The use of any proper name for the one and true God is entirely inappropriate for the universal faith of the Christian church. That's just ridiculous. It's it's just a crazy argument. They know full well that the name Jesus and many other names in the Bible that they use was not originally perhaps how they were pronounced. So that's just begging the question. But now contrast what the translators of these Bibles in Christendom say as to the translators of the New World Translation. In the big Um, type version they say this in the foreword since the Bible sets forth the sacred will of the sovereign Lord of the universe it would be a great indignity indeed an affront to his majesty and authority to omit or hide his unique name which plainly occurs in the Hebrew text Nearly 7,000 times. What a contrast. But now Christendom's leaders have even gone further than this to than blotting out his name from the Bible. They've replaced the precious truths in God's word 
with pagan teachings, with modernist ideas. And one outspoken clergyman in Nigeria said this, Today in Nigeria we find reverend gentlemen who protect themselves with juju charms and amulets right inside the church of God. They brought in these pagan teachings and ideas. And as a result of this collapse of spirituality throughout Christendom, how true are those words of Jesus found in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. Jesus certainly stated things plainly, and he did that on this occasion. Matthew 15, 8. This people honors me with their lips, Yet their heart is far removed from me. It's in vain that they keep worshipping me because they can teach commands of men as doctrines. But oh my, what a contrast is this spiritual famine condition within the realms of Christendom throughout the world compared to the only people who are willing and proud enough to bear God's name. We know who they are. There's only one people who bear the name Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses, and who have quenched their thirst with the spring-like waters of truth from God's word alone. To them, the words of Psalm 23 that we sang about this beautiful song, 77, Jehovah's My Shepherd, is based on Psalm 23. I'd just like to read it to you with what I've said in the introduction to my talk and what we're going to talk about. It's beautiful the way it's put here. Psalm 23. Jehovah is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. In grassy pastures he makes me lie down. By well-watered resting places he conducts me. My soul he refreshes. And he leads me in the tracks of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the valley of deep shadow, I fear nothing bad, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff are the things that comfort me. You arrange before me a table in front of those showing hostility to me. With oil you've greased my head. My cup is well filled. And surely goodness and loving kindness themselves will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of Jehovah to the length of days. Very personal question to everyone here this morning. Have you experienced those beautiful expressive words coming true in your life? Are you like David, content with Jehovah's spiritual provisions that he's now making for his people? Well, this is a matter that you and I want to have a really personal talk about this morning. I don't want you to think of this as a lecture. I want you to think of it as just a little personal exchange of thoughts. Jehovah's loving shepherding care is especially made available through three channels of communication. His word, his Holy Spirit, and his earthly organized people. We're going to take one at a time and make sure that we're content with each of them. You can all see that. (laughs) Please turn with me to Psalm 119. There's a verse here that I want to draw your attention to. Verse 160. And I suggest that all of us always keep this in mind. Whenever someone asks you, what is the difference between you and all of us who are christened in Christendom? The substance of your word is truth. 
And every righteous judicial decision of yours is to time indefinite. Here's the big difference between Jehovah's Witnesses and all others who profess the name of God and to follow in Christ's footsteps today. We accept the substance of the Bible as truth. Many years ago in the 1940s, when I was visiting one of our congregations in the southwest of England, this was brought home to me very forcefully. As one of our servants or elders, now called, he was having a study with a lady who had been a very armed churchgoer. And uh, on one occasion, without warning him, she had invited his, her clergyman to come along. And there he was, ready, sitting at the table. And this brother came in to have a study. So the clergyman was all ready to completely undermine what she'd been ta being taught. However, our dear brother, he said this, which I thought was so good, I've never forgotten it. He said, before we start our discussion, I would like to suggest that we leave out of our discussion the two greatest liars that exist today. And the clergyman kind of looked and said, who's there? I think, and they say, we're going to leave them out of the picture. It's what God says. So that completely floundered this reverend gentleman. And I think it's so true. People are so apt to say, well, I think, well, they say, but it's what God says. How important is this? It's ever so important. Romans 15.4, many of you know what it says there. Paul says, For all the things that were written right from Adam and Eve's creation, aforetime were written for our instruction through our endurance and through the comfort from the scriptures, we might have hope. The whole of God's word. Jesus said on one occasion, John 14 and verse 6, on that last night that he was with his disciples, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's here, only here in the Bible that we find about that way, how Jesus stood up for the truth. How he opened up the way to life through his ransom sacrifice. Now you see, how do these true statements, this substance of the Bible make us feel? Do they make us feel happy? Do they make us excited? They should do. You turn with me to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. And ask yourself the question. Do I fit into what is stated here by this angel? Who said, verse 3, Happy is he who reads aloud, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and who observe the things written in it, for the appointed time is here, near. Are you, am I, and we alone can answer this question, one of those happy ones who not only reads God's word daily, but who allows it to sink deep into our heart. And it so motivates us that we do observe God's commandments. Now we can answer yes to that question. We are content with this provision that God has given to us. So the shepherding care of Jehovah in a Christian's life is also seen by the wonderful provision of his Holy Spirit. We can't see it, but there's no reason for not believing it, that it exists. There's a lot of things that exist we can't see. I remember when I was growing up as a boy, my brother was bigger and stronger than I was. He was taller. When there was a storm in the North Sea of Scotland, I used to just love to go down to the beach and watch the waves. And I, 
begged my mother and father to allow me to go down and they said yes you can go as long as you take your brother with you and down we went and I can imagine to this day walking along the, those cliffs with that roaring sea behind us hanging on to my brother for grim life seeing the trees bending right over bending down this tremendous force unseen to us. We know that it exists, these great winds, because of the effect that they have. I had a lot to do with electricity in days gone by, and I was fascinated with the fact that this is a power that exists, but, for example, all the lights in the hall here, an indication that there is a power behind there, Supposing this was a piece of metal, soft steel. <coughs> Supposing I was to put a big coil of wire around it, much bigger than this, send a force the electric current around it, what would happen? All the little particles, the atomic particles in this piece of soft metal, which were all different angles to begin with, would all be pulled in one direction due to the what we call a magnetic field set up by this coil of wire. And now this piece of metal that perhaps wasn't much used before, it's become a magnet. It's of real use in the hand of man. That power, we know it exists because of the effects. Now with regard to God's Holy Spirit, the effects of this are all described for us in Galatians 5. And the last two verses. No, 22, 23. The other hand, the fruitage of the Spirit, now notice, is joy, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, mildness, self-control against such things. There's no law. How far have you, how far have I got in cultivating these things? You know, it might amaze you that I've always had to fight in my life against not getting impatient and worked up about things. Self-control. Sometimes it's so easy to blurt something out and hurt the one that you love the most. How far have we got in cultivating all of these things in our life? How big an effort are we putting forth to display them in our life? The extent to which we have is an indication to what extent we are content with that power of God operating in our life. Depends upon us how big an effect it has upon us. Do you remember on one occasion when Jesus returned to his home city of Nazareth? He entered into the synagogue that he'd often been. I'm not going to turn it up with you, but in Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 3, he quoted those words. He prefaced them by the Spirit of God, of Jehovah, is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the good news. And during the life course of Jesus, it's very evident that he depended upon that. You remember the expression such as, you know, I can't do a single thing of my own initiative. It's only what God tells me and empowers me to do. That showed how much Jesus depended upon this power of God's Spirit. And he was a perfect man. Now, we are imperfect. We have the commission to preach the good news. It's not easy to go and talk to our neighbors sometimes about things that we feel that we're not interested in. But it's only through the power of God's Spirit that all over the world, six million and more of God's people, continue to show love to their neighbor by telling them how they can gain life in the new world of righteousness. How much do we rely on it in our preaching work? How much do we pray for it? How often do we pray for it? The extent that we do is an indication of how much we 
appreciate this provision of Jehovah. We're going to deal with one more item. Jehovah's loving shepherding care is certainly seen through the provisions of his earthly organization. Sometimes good, you know, an occasion like this to just ponder and think about all the things that Jehovah has given to us, which I'm going to do just for a minute or two with you. Let me just find the outline for the talk that I'm giving because I didn't just make up this talk myself. Here we are, are you content with Jehovah's provisions? Number 22E. You've heard that talk before. You might say to me, but Brother Bar, I've not just heard it but be given like you were giving it. Of course not. We're all, it's so flexible, these outlines. We don't need to just adhere to every single statement that, the wording that's made. We didn't use all the scriptures. One brother might choose some, one, one might another. But all the scriptures that I'm using this morning are really, are really appear in these outlines. We've got 160 of them. You dear brothers who are elders, who are permission, who are able to give these talks, how grateful are you for this provision of Jehovah? Think of you had to get up this talk yourself. How long would it take you? Do I determine me to 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13? First Corinthians chapter 2 and 13 verse. Paul said these things, the things that he had been talking about, about the truth, different facets of the truth, we also speak not with words taught by human wisdom. You see, he didn't, it's not what I, he thought. But, I've lost the place, but with those taught by the Spirit, as we combine spiritual matters with spiritual words. In the meeting that follows, we are going to discuss a spiritual matter that is highlighted in this issue of the Watchtower and it's entitled Christians be proud of who you are very much in line with our day's text well that is a scriptural matter but it's all based upon scriptural words actual um, uh, texts that are taken from the Bible I counted them up this morning. There are 47 different scriptural citations all bound together in unity and in harmony with regard to this subject. How long would any of you take to prepare material like this? What a blessing! Every single two weeks we have a different subject. Just like a mother that prepares a beautiful meal, invites guests to come. There it is on the table, all ready for them. It's just you've got to just sit down and, and eat it and digest it properly. And the other Jehovah spreads a table in front of our enemies. All over the world it's in existence. And every one of the hundred and thousand more congregations. The same material at the same time. You know, you should have accompanied me when I went to some of these little South Pacific Islands. The brothers were all isolated. And yet, to know that they were discussing the same thing as we were over here in America, it just thrills them. It brings together the unity and harmony of God's people, feeding on the same things at the same time. Well, what about the Awake magazine? You know, there's a lot of things in the awake that I learn about that I never knew of before. For example, there was an article entitled Muscles, Masterpieces of Design. Do you wonder if you remember that? There are 600 and, 650 muscles in the body. 30 of these muscles are in your face. 
And as I smiled, there's 14 of these muscles required to make that smile. I never knew that before. Taste, gift of a loving creator. That was another article. How many taste buds in your tongue? Oh, there can be up to 10,000. Think of the number of varieties. How it makes a meal enjoyable. There's another article, just one more. Probing the secrets of the eel. This fascinated me. Do you know, the, uh, there are two specific kind of eels uh, that uh, are so predominant. The American and the European eel. Both of these kinds spawn in what's called the Sargasso Sea, up in the North Atlantic there. And then after they spawn, all the little eels come down toward Bermuda. And then for some unknown reason, all the European eels go that way to Europe and the American eels come this way. Why? There's so many things that happen in in nature that we just don't begin to understand our awake magazine how helpful in bringing these things to our attention that builds up our faith and confidence that there really is a creator i got quite a few other little things here theocratic ministry school schedule well that is a wonderful provision that school that you'd never get anywhere else in the world and the reviews with questions that can suit those of all ages we've got the kingdom ministry based upon the needs in the field and uh, there are excellent suggestions I know I find them so helpful I get a little bit tired of myself and the same things that I say and this helps me Jehovah provides it all. And then when you begin to think about our special assembly days and the, and the circuit assembly, what about our Walk with God district convention last year? Program. All tied in together with a theme. Walk with God. I ask you, Brothers, how long would it take us individually to prepare something like this? And yet, it's just prepared for us. And Jehovah says, come to the district convention. Go on, help yourself and get the most out of it. He provides everything for our needs. Oh, what a loving God Jehovah truly is. I got a little something in my pocket I brought along. I know that you can get them on CDs. You know what this is. Kingdom Melodies. Our orchestra of 60 devoted brothers who spent hours and hours, I remember them spending 12 hours on one occasion to just produce two minutes of music for you, for me, to be uplifted with compared to the music in this whole world, which is a reflection of the agitation that there is in the world today. But here is something to really upbuild our souls. And when you hear the music, it reminds us of the words which are so beautiful. Traveling overseers like Paul, they strengthen the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to remain in the faith, as Acts 14.22 says. Do you appreciate that provision? We get many letters of appreciation sent in. Here's one. We've received so many wonderful blessings from Jehovah over the years. It's good to have a grateful heart like that. I'm approaching 30 years as a baptized servant of Jehovah. How grateful I am for so many conventions, assemblies, schools, publications, and brothers that I love so very much. Thank you. I especially want to express gratitude for the spiritually qualified men in the form of traveling overseers and their wives, both circuit and district. I often reflect on how much we here in this circuit have been helped to grow as a result of the fine spiritual instruction given by these men over the years. Brothers, I'm sure you can relate to that. 
I mentioned to some of you yesterday how that I was on the traveling work and I can enter into what a great amount of effort is expended by these dear brothers and their faithful wives. They're always giving out, giving out, trying to encourage. I know I need that as much as you do. We have our circuit assembly just coming up. We have the district and circuit overseers coming to visit our congregation in Brooklyn Heights. I'll certainly be there. No matter how long you've been in the truth, we need it. And we are grateful to Jehovah. All provided through his organization. Not to be forget, forgotten are the great array of publications, including the Draw Close to Jehovah book. I don't suppose we've ever had a publication that has resulted in so many letters of appreciation. I'm sure all of us who have been studying it feel that we've been drawn close to him. That was a provision through God's organization. Can you not see, brothers, we talk about this matter this morning, how well cared for we are. Doesn't it show us how much Jehovah loves us? You listen to this outside commentator in a Brazilian newspaper, O Tempo. He said, although there's many imposing religions with their propaganda in all parts of the globe, there does not exist a single one on the face of the earth today that shows the same love as Jehovah's Witnesses. That's an outsider. And we can relate to that, can't we? Surely it makes us feel, if you turn with me to what the psalmist says, Psalm 40 and verse 5. It's a very, very favorite scripture of mine. Psalm 40 and verse 5. All found it? Many things you yourself have done, O Jehovah my God, and we can relate to that You know, so many things he's done through his earthly arrangement of things today. Even your wonderful works, your thoughts toward us, there's none to be compared to you. What I'm inclined to tell and speak of them, they've become more numerous than I can recount. And that's how I feel when I talk to you here this morning, brothers. We have a heart-to-heart discussion. Time would just fail for us to go over all the things that Jehovah's done. His thoughts toward us are all contained here in his word of truth, the Bible. For example, here's one of the many thoughts expressed. John 14 and verse, John 17 and verse 14, in that prayer to Jehovah, Jesus said regarding his followers, they're no part of the world, just as I'm no part of the world. And because of the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses are no part of the world, their life pattern becomes so different from all the peoples living around them. This is the way Jehovah intended it to be. This is the safeguard for us today in the world. It was the same with regard to Jehovah's dealings with the nation of Israel. The keeping of the law set that nation of Israel absolutely apart, made them stand out a mile in difference from all the nations around them. The keeping of that law was their safeguard. Filled them with lots to do if they kept it correctly. But it made them contented with the spiritual provisions God has made. But what happened? Do you know so often these Israelites they got weary carrying out all the details of that law. They really, in effect, said what Malachi 1 and verse 13 says. I'll let you look it up in your own Bible. Malachi 1, 13. Here's one of many Jehovah's minor prophets, what he said to the nation of Israel that wasn't keeping his law. Verse 13 You have said, look what a weariness. And you've caused a sniffing at it, Jehovah of armies has said. The uh, today's English version says, 
You say how tired we are of all this, and you turn up your nose at me. Very expressive. But you know, joking apart, brothers, we've got to be ever so careful that we never fall into this attitude to take these loving provisions, God's word, his Holy Spirit, and his organization for granted. To feel that being a follower of Jesus is it's just too difficult. Oh, there's so many things we've got to do. We can't fit them all in. Well, we won't ever take that attitude if we never forget that spiritual famine that's gripping Christendom today and indeed the billions held in the non-Christian religions. Jehovah uses only his witnesses to cry out to all those spiritually hungry throughout the world. These words found at Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Isaiah 55. Hey there, all you thirsty ones, come to the water. And the ones that have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk, even without money and without price. Why do you people keep paying out money for what is not bread? Why is your toil for what results no satisfaction? Listen intently to me and eat what is good and let your soul find its exquisite delight and fatness itself. There's no other body of people apart from Jehovah's Witnesses that are in a position to be able to quench the thirst, satisfy the hunger in a spiritual way of those that are in spiritual need today. And to get relief, you know, individuals have to do what was symbolically symbolized when the famine struck the land of Egypt in Joseph's day. Do you remember eventually what they had to do? They had to sell themselves to Joseph, become his servants. Well, today, truth seekers must dedicate themselves to Jehovah, must follow in the footsteps of Jesus if they want to be spiritually fed. And we're in a position to help them to do just that. And when we always remember this famine and how we're able to help these who are really crying out for help, it makes us never take these loving provisions for granted. If we're really content with Jehovah's provisions today, we'll show this by staying content ourselves and helping others to enjoy the same Happiness as we enjoy. Well, after having talked about this matter together, how do you feel about it? Contented? Satisfied? With all that Jehovah has done for us? I hope so. You see, what I've been talking to you about I need to talk to myself about continually because the devil is so anxious to make us discontented like he did Eve and Adam with Jehovah's provisions, what he's provided. So we need a constant reminder. When I give this talk, it's a little reminder to me as well as those that I talk to. And we need to keep in mind Final words that I'm going to read to you, very beautiful, from Psalm 145, 15 to 18. God's word is so precious, isn't it? Just fits into every situation that we have to talk to about. Psalm 145, verse 15. To you, that is to Jehovah, The eyes of all look hopefully. You're giving them their food in its season. You're opening your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. Jehovah is righteous in all his ways and loyal in all his works. Jehovah is near to all those calling upon him, to all those who call upon him in trueness. 
So finally, may I just say to you, dear friends, may all of us stay close to those today who look to Jehovah. They do so because they know that he can supply their every need. Then we'll find our every spiritual need satisfied. So in view of what Jehovah has already done for us and is going to do for us in the near future, we've got just every reason to be content with Jehovah's provisions.